Well, Drew, it's Halloween time. What horror movie should we watch next? Well, Matt, we could watch that super scary movie, you know, the one that's nine months long. Oh, you're talking about 2020. Hey, who stars in that again? Us. All right, perfect, we got it one take. <laughs> All right, and welcome back to another episode. As always, I'm Matt. I'm Drew. And this is Reboot Review. This is where we look at uh, some horror films during Halloween times that they decided to bring back. And today, we are looking at Evil Dead 2013. And it's also a little different because we're actually, we're filming this one. Yeah. So, you know, you get to, you get to, see, the, you get to see the face with the voice. I bet everyone's really depressed. <laughs> Evil Dead came out in 2013. It's directed by Fide Alvarez. It's uh, written by Rodo Segeus. It's got a budget of 17 million, a box office of 97.5 million. It stars Jane Levy, Shiloh Fernandez, Lou Taylor Pucci, Jessica Lucas, and Elizabeth Blackmore. Evil Dead is about a girl named Mia who heads to an isolated cabin with four friends in hopes of quitting her drug addiction. Things turn out for the worse when the group discovers the aftermath of a horrendous act and a demonic book that summons evil from below. That's Did you my, write that? Or? Yeah, that's my little makeshift yeah. uh, one right there. It's really good. Yeah. I think it's a good one to end on because, I mean, I don't think it's an overjump to say that we're both big Evil Dead fans. Yeah. Right? So. Yeah. I think I think the whole reason we did the reboot review was because of this movie, and then we tacked on the other four episodes to make it, <laughs> <laughs> to make it like, logical. Yeah. But, yeah. but this is also, like, a different reboot, too, because this isn't a situation where, the, you know, the original movie is successful on its own, and then because of that, they try to kind of cash in on that by putting a new twist or spin on it. Like, you know, I think of Child's Play, where they're not really taking anything from the original besides just a killer doll, and then they're applying something new to it. Whereas in this one, the original's not amazing. And a lot of people <laughs> know this about the original. There was a lot of production problems, and, uh, you know, you can see certain wires and stuff in shots from, like, little effects that they were trying to do. So, but, but, but it's also one of those films where with Evil Dead 2 and then Army of Darkness and then even with the show Ash vs. Evil Dead, they've really kind of toned in more on what they're going for and they've kind of mastered it. So even with this remake, they're taking the name and that's really what's going to get people into the seats, but they can really pretty much do whatever they want with this reboot. Well, I think what they wanted to do was they wanted to make something that was more true to what Sam Raimi's original vision is. You say that they like found their, you know, what they were going for in uh, the sequels and in the TV show. Yeah. But I think that wasn't really what they were going for. I think that's what it kind of ended up being. So what they, they were, were going for, I think, was more what this movie was. Yeah, like maybe they were going for a way more kind of serious, grounded approach with the first one, and then they decided to make it more comical. Yeah, because I, I feel like it will like, I don't know if this is true, but I feel yeah. like it was kind of, the first one was kind of campy, yeah. like unintentionally bad. And then what they did with the second one was they kind of leaned into that because that's what Sam Raimi had more, I guess Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell and maybe the whole creative team had more fun doing. Yeah. And that's more of the story they wanted to tell. And so far as they essentially remade the first movie with that more ridiculous approach and like the ridiculous monsters and the set pieces and all of that stuff in Evil Dead 2. Yeah. And then you take it, you know, up to 100 with Army of Darkness and Ash versus Evil Dead. But I think there was that original like kernel of an idea of like, this is all serious and this is all uh, kind of the same way that uh, The Exorcist was. Yeah. Where they're saying and doing ridiculous things that could be construed as like funny but uh actually taking it seriously and playing it more straight like the the exorcist did uh with this uh, reboot and we'll kind of get into some stuff that they borrow that the reboot borrows from the original yeah uh, but just kind of start it off um evil dead 2013 is this a reboot or is this a sequel and i'll ask you first before i kind of give some information onto that and this is something that other like channels and people have talked about before but just for our kind of take on it is this a sequel or is this a reboot like it's a reboot okay because the, What's the argument for a sequel yeah so the directors actually said uh fide alvarez that this actually takes place 30 years after the original oh okay which is interesting because there's still similar beats so that you could almost make that argument that it's like history repeating itself yeah but he actually thinks that this is in the same world and then there was actually an interview with bruce campbell when they were promoting season three of Ash vs. Evil Dead, where uh, I think 
he threw this out there to try to get more people to watch because they were trying to get that fourth season on Stars. But he said something along the lines of like, and you know, maybe if you support this season, you know, we'll do a little crossover with the, the, the remake that they did in 2013. Maybe we bring that character into the world with Ash and something like that. Because he does that cameo at the end of the reboot, the 2013 reboot, where he the, says the, Groovy. The timeline's always been, like, <laughs> crazy with Evil Dead. Because, yeah, like, what is what is Evil Dead 2? Is that a remake or is that a sequel? Yeah. I guess, personally, I would like it if this movie was still set in the world, if it was canon with the Evil Dead world, because I would like to see a, a crossover with Mia and Ash. I don't know if that's going to happen anymore, though. I know, but it would have been... It would have been interesting. Using the using the actual universe rules that Sam Raimi created yeah. and going based on what anything the creative team said, I think is too... Because the rules for the Evil Dead universe alone are too crazy. Yeah. Uh, going based off of just general rules and what this feels like, I think it feels a lot more like a reboot. So I got some talking points here that we can kind of go through. That's great. If you want to. But, you know, the first thing I want to kind of bring up is the differences between these reboots, right? And with this one, I mean, it's going to be kind of easy because the 1981 version is the, you know, it's the rec- directorial debut of Sam Raimi, and they're making this on a $350,000 budget, so they're doing things on the fly. It's not perfect, but it was also very unique for its time and kind of led the way for certain types of ways that you kind of shoot horror movies, yeah, 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 I guess, right? But with this 2013 one, there's much more of a vision. It's at least refreshing just to see that there is an actual vision being put into place. I know that, not being like meddled with. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, just at least with the tone that he's going for and the pacing that he's going for mm-hmm. with the two, because this is a more grounded version that they're just kind of making. You know, they're, they're keeping the, the the bloody gore and the ridiculousness of that, mm-hmm. but they're making a lot more like, what if it was real? Yeah, yeah, but I think that that really helps because it, it provides more depth not just visually, but also within the story. Because in the 1981 Evil Dead, the reason that they're going to the cabin, and we can kind of now start getting into some differences between the original and the reboot, but (laughs) just from a plot perspective, you know, they're going to the cabin because the one guy, he basically is like, yeah, I just got this house for cheap. So we're just gonna go up there on vacation and party for the weekend. That's like a bed and breakfast. It's like, yeah, it's like a, it's, it's like a vacation gone wrong. Um, Whereas in this one, it appears to be like a family, cabin that they've gone to throughout the years but when we open the well movie, no they haven't been there for at least like 10 years i think yeah but there's like pictures inside the cabin of they've them been there in like the past kids. but like the distant past yeah but there's also been like squatters or like the hills have eyes type people that have been using their cellar you can just call them locals <laughs> i guess but they're all very like he, he really puts a lot of focus on like some really weird looking folk in the opening of it because you got the dead cats and the bats and stuff mm-hmm. you know hanging from the ceiling and they got the evil dead girl tied up to the pole, and this isn't their cabin, but I mean, I believe, I mean, as an audience, like, I, I think at the top of it when I'm watching, I'm like, oh, this is their cabin. But then later you're gonna find out, like, no, this, they were just squatters. Yeah. They're, kind they're, of they're, they're not squatters. I mean, like I said, when we were watching this, yeah. you gotta find a place to, like, conduct these spells and these rituals. You can't just do it in, like, you know, grandma's bedroom. You gotta, like, find a place where you can, like, burn it down, essentially, because they're gonna purify her with fire. Well, I just don't think they needed to add it, that whole thing where this is their childhood cabin also. They probably could have kept the same thing from 1981, where it's like, yeah, I just found a cheap cabin, but the reasons why they're going there, they, they, they could have kept still. Well, it makes more sense because, you know, you're not just gonna rent a cheap cabin and then, like, we're gonna do a... What is it? Not a cleanse, but a, or just a cold turkey. Cold turkey yeah. kind of We're doing cold run. turkey in this like rundown cabin we just found. You would do like, it's our family cabin. It would be, you know, I don't know what, like, constructive or like supportive because it's like, you know, old memories. It's like from your past. Then when they go in that cellar for the first time in 2013, they almost act as if they've never seen the cellar before. <laughs> but it's like, you grew up with this cabin. Like, I would expect them to go down there and be like, what happened to the cellar? I guess, kind of, yeah. The cellar would be the thing that, like, changed the most. And I don't know. They probably just weren't down there very much as kids. Yeah. Well, speaking of similarities and differences, let's let's keep diving into this, uh, of the differences between the two. And let's talk about the demons first. Let's talk about the deadites. The only thing that's the difference between them, because I think that what they borrowed from the original in regards to just gore, uh, in regards to, like, kind of over-the-top, you know, effects, I guess, mm-hmm. as you want to call it. Um, but the one thing that they kind of kept, but they didn't, was the silliness of it, was the little campiness of it. Well, that's the thing is, like, yeah, you don't you don't add campiness. Campiness is a side effect of someone did something wrong. Yeah. Um, in the 1981 version, every time somebody gets possessed by the demon or by the deadite, mm-hmm. they're, they're very comical. Like, they're all, they're they're taunting. You know, they're, they're over the top. I, don't, yeah. I wouldn't call them comical, but yeah, well, it's, it's over it's, the top. It's, all right, just amusing. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
But uh, in the 2013 version, Mia's the only one that really gets to have fun as a Deadite. That's true, She's yeah. the only one that really curses, that taunts, that like, you know, whereas in every other person that gets infected becomes more kind of like a zombie. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they're kind of just like, you know. More serious, yeah. Yeah, mo moving forward, whereas in, I think it was more fun for the actors in 1981 where you got to see a different version of, a, of a sillier Deadite. I don't think it was fun for those actors in 1981. <laughs> no, it wasn't, but just like on a performance level, like, you know, even uh, in the 2013 version when she gets the puke from Mia yeah. on her and then she goes in the bathroom and cuts off her face, mm -hmm. you probably could have kept that intensity, but then added a little, like, ha-cha-cha-cha. -cha -cha. No, she, 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 <laughs> she just whips around and then you, like, you know, like, smashes yeah, like, him onto her. What's the matter? You don't like my face? Yeah. You know, something like that. Because so, I don't either. <laughs> exactly. That was the one thing that was just interesting that they, 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 they kind of borrowed and kept stuff still, but they mm -hmm. didn't take everything. So That's what I liked is that they made it more grounded. They made it more grounded, but I still think they could have kept each Deadite still kind of being a little sillier because, you know, even when she's shooting the nail gun. I think Mia's silly enough for all of them. All right, yeah, that's fair. Well, she kind of shines in this the most. She and, does, yeah. And let's actually keep talking about similarities and differences and let's talk about how they kind of awaken this evil. Yeah. So in 1981, the evil's already awoken. It's like, it's so vague. The, it, the 1981 is so vague. It really is just a, here's a, here's an excuse to have a bunch of people die. Well, I, I say it's already awoken because when the words are spoken, it initiates it. But it's got to be out there in the sphere. It's got to be out there in the world yeah. at first. Mm -hmm. So when they show up to the cabin, some things that tell me that the evil is already there is uh, when she's drawing the sister of Ash. Yeah. When she's drawing, it like takes over and it turns book, into yeah. a book. And then when they're sitting at the kitchen table, the, the cellar just opens. Yeah. So it's the evil, like almost very similar to Cabin in the Woods, where it's trying to get them down there mm -hmm. to play the recorder so that it can you know, do its whole camera thing and, and come to the door. I think it's guiding them toward the book. Yeah, but, yeah. But then the cam they end up getting the voice recorder. Yeah, and the evil, like, has motivation to get them to kind of release it. Whereas in 2013, they they successfully did it with that opening scene of burning that girl. So mm -hmm. it's like everything's locked away. Yeah, exactly. Then this English teacher's just going well, to open it up they, they, and they, read they, it. They seal the evil away and then they just leave the book there. And it's like, can you at least have, like, buried it or something? Well, the only reason why I just, I, I prefer the 1981 is because it's more circumstantial. It's more like this is something that already exists. Then these kind of teenagers are going to kind of come and they're going to deal with it. And it's like anyone could have come across this cabin sure. and it's already released. Whereas in this one, it's very like reactionary. It's very like he's gonna he's gonna set it off first and then they're gonna react to it. But it's that it's, I think it's more meticulous. It's that rule of like stupid characters. It's kind of like Child's Play 2019, where you have dumb characters that are doing things to get the plot going yeah. versus just establish that it's already there. And then you can like have your fun after the fact. I, I'm I'm okay with it in this one because it's only the one dumb character. It's not like they're all dumb. It's yeah. the, it's the boring English teacher guy, and like he's you know he's not a likable character. So it it doesn't make logical sense that he's going to be stupid and set off the evil. But it at least is like it tracks in his character mm -hmm. that he would be the one that kind of meddles with stuff that he doesn't understand and ends up unleashing all of this because he's not a good in like the sense of bad and good yeah. the character. Well, I think they could have just played with that a little bit because the whole movie is about, well, not the whole movie, but at least with Mia and her central theme about addiction and overcoming addiction, they probably could have given that to other characters. Like, what are their vices? What are the things that they have a problem with? Maybe this English teacher who sees this like, you know, old text and stuff, he's very arrogant. So his weakness is that he's always like, he keeps going. He keeps I think that's looking. what it was. Uh, I, could, I could see that. It's just for me, it's like they could have made a comment to him, like maybe David or someone says to him, like, man, you never know when to stop. You know, just about anything. That way, when he's physically doing stuff, we, we know that that's what his character does. Whereas in this one, it's like, whereas in what they did, he's just doing it. And then we go, well, he must be an arrogant person that doesn't know how to stop. But, but they don't overdo it. No. And I think in, after kind of talking about similarities, we'll just talk about some things that the reboot straight borrows. So yeah. it's, it's, it's kind of like a copy. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing, but I got a list here of uh, things that the reboot borrows, not just from Evil Dead 1, but uh, from the whole franchise, actually. Ooh. So th the necklace is the first thing, and it's actually just like, looks just like the same necklace mm -hmm. from the first one. <laughs> Which I don't know if that's symbolic of anything. I didn't recognize it. Just seeing that, I think, is just like a wink for the audience to recognize it the same way, I guess, in Child's Play, that he says Chucky, even though there's no reason for them well, to call actually, him Chucky. Well, there's actually, there's Child's motivation, Play. because in the original, they give it, he gives it to his girlfriend, and in mm -hmm. this one, he gives it to his sister. It's well, like I said, these are copies, but it's not like a bad thing. Yeah. It's just, it's just kind of obvious that's from, uh, the other one is obviously the shotgun. Yeah. Um, it doesn't become as uh, important in this reboot with the shotgun as it really just is like another. She just goes for the chainsaw. 
Yeah, yeah, and that's another kind of symbolic link as well. But just you know, focusing on the fact with the book and the shotgun, like having those kind of two things. Um, another one is the chains being tied to the seller. You know, in the 1981 yeah. version, they really try to focus on making sure you see that in certain shots. Mm -hmm. And then in this one, they, they, they do a little bit of it. And there's some more kind of camera stuff they borrow. Well, that's nice that they, like, they actually go through to like build it. Yeah. Where it's not just already there. It's like, we need it because the whatever the fucking lock they already have on there is not enough. It still serves the reboot plot, and it doesn't feel like they're borrowing it just so you don't become bored. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's not like, you know... Uh, in the grudge where it's like, I remember that, mm -hmm. you know, it, it more so services it. Um, yeah, it's like motivated. Another thing that they're borrowing is uh, cutting off the arm. They cut off two arms in the reboots, but interesting enough, that's actually something that they take from Evil Dead 2. So no one even loses a limb in the first Evil Dead. I mean, mm -hmm. Ash does chop up one of the deadites at the end of Evil Dead 1, but um, that's kind of more similar to borrowing stuff kind of from the whole franchise that we kind of recognize. Yeah. Um, another thing are the insert shots in the work shed of building something, even though I think that's even still a little bit more Evil Dead 2 as well. Because that is Evil Dead 2. When did they do it in the reboot? Well, David, when he's building the uh, defibrillator. When he's building the yeah, okay. when he goes into the, the work shed to build yeah. the defibrillator. Another copy uh, that they do in the reboot is burying a body and it being a struggle. So in 1981, Ash is burying his girlfriend mm -hmm. out there, and she's physically kind of fighting him. So he's got to, like, cut her head off, mm -hmm. and then even when he's still burying the body, the head's just kind of like yapping away. Is that <laughs> Evil Dead there. 1 or 2? That's Evil Dead 1. Okay. They do it differently in Evil Dead 2. Okay. Um, but in the reboot, they have the same thing where David is burying Mia's body, mm -hmm. but it's more of an emotional struggle because, uh, you know, she's like doing the whole, like, you never liked me, did you, David? And doing that, which I really like that scene a lot. I like that too, yeah. Even though after he gets done burying her, the tree burns out, so I guess that's the signal that yeah. she's ready, she's she's gonna get dug up it's, again. It's symbolic. Real quick, can I can I pivot real quick? Yeah. What do you think of her performance in the scene where she uh it's when like David comes into her room like right oh, when she's like whispering yeah like whispering and she's like terrified. Well it's interesting because I've seen like other reviews and people talk about it where they think that those scenes kind of drag the movie down where it's trying to be a more standard kind of horror movie. Mm -hmm. But I like those scenes because it's more personable it's more like character related so you know and i think like i said i think that she carries the movie with her performance she gets to have the most fun she mm -hmm. gets to be grounded she gets to be terrified and then she gets to be like you know comical crazy. yeah crazy comical <laughs> and then on top of that she gets to then also have that kind of like revenge kind of fuck you attitude mm -hmm. at the very end so she really gets like a full arc out of it so um i like that scene a lot i think if it was your first time watching uh, this reboot, this is like our third, fourth time kind of watching it. Mm -hmm. So I, I already know these kind of beats already, but if it was your first time watching it. I remember like kind of being scared uh, from her, like, you know, being all quiet and be like, you have to get me out of here. Yeah, <laughs> you know? it was a weird performance, but I really liked it. No, I, I, thought it was, I thought it was a good take on Terrified. Yeah. And then after this, she goes on uh, to do like Don't Breathe with the same writer director mm -hmm. as well. And now she's got like, you know, these projects, yeah. which I don't know the names of. Sure. And then the final thing that I have as far as like copying or paying homage to is going to be uh, a little phrase that either Ash says or that Mia says. So in 2013, uh, the little naked devil thing that Mia's fighting, she goes, I will feast on your soul. Face on this motherfucker. Uh, in Evil Dead 2, uh, the Deadite says to Ash, Hey, I'll swallow your soul! I'll swallow your soul! I'll swallow your soul! <laughs> swallow this. Nice. So it's another little, another little updated homage kind of wink mm -hmm. that they do. Um, but, you know, if we don't have anything else we really want to say about the movie, I feel like we've talked a lot about it and we've kind of talked about similarities and differences. We can kind of get into the ranking of this. So, uh... As always on the show, uh, we ask three questions that lead to a final question vote. Uh, we got to figure out a better way to say it. We've been doing this for uh, so long. I, I know. think we have one already. Uh, but the first one is going to be, uh, does it work as a reboot? And you can go ahead and start it off if you want. Um, I think it does work as a reboot. Going back and looking at all the homages that you were kind of like listing off uh, before, all of the ways that they were kind of building on the source material without undermining it, the fact that they chose to include the tree branch scene instead of cutting it because they were afraid of people's reactions. I think all those things kind of make it uh, a solid reboot. I kind of want to respond a little bit more to what you say, but honestly, those are pretty much what checked well, it off for I'll me. Make it, I'll make it quick and easy for you, because I also think it works as a reboot. And it's interesting, because the only other movies that we've done so far is, you know, Child's Play, Grudge, and Carrie. And within those, you can feel sometimes that 
they're kind of worried that the audience isn't going to know what's going on unless you have those connectors back mm-hmm. to the first one. Whereas in I don't feel like, you know, Evil Dead's a pretty big cult classic. It's got very loyal fans to it, but I would think there's more people that would be watching this 2013 reboot that's never even seen the original or the second I one. I saw this one matter. before I saw the original. Well, even, but even just like, you know, just any anyone else, yeah. like is just watching it as like a standard horror movie if it was just on Hulu or Netflix or something like that. But um, they do a good job of making it appear as if they're it's their original ideas with some of the stuff that they pay homage mm-hmm. to. So this is probably the best kind of balance, uh, a little bit more similar to Carrie because that had a good balance of, you know, paying homage to the original, taking actual lines of dialogue from the original, but also keeping whatever new voice that they were trying to put on. And like actually building on it instead of like replacing it. Yeah, whereas in this one, I think does an even stronger job of that, Mm -hmm. where it mixes it in a lot better. All right, so that's gonna be two checks for that. So the next question is gonna be, is it enjoyable slash entertaining in its genre? Obviously this is a Halloween horror movie. So, you know, all the stuff that makes movies like that work and including like what they're kind of going for as well. Cause you know, sometimes, you know they're going for a certain kind of tone especially with these reboots and it does not translate Mm -hmm. over the years and that's probably the reason like you know why they changed the voodoo stuff from child's play when we did that yeah yeah. Uh, but this one's a little different because there's a lot of stuff that can translate uh over time but i'll go ahead and ask you again does a is it enjoyable slash entertaining yeah i think this is like if you just want to go based off the criteria of like does this work as a horror movie just on its own Mm -hmm. or is it enjoyable as a horror movie then yeah i think uh all the kills are great. The Mia monster is great. The abomination's great. The deadites and like what happens to the friends when they get infected. I, I, I don't know. I do like it when you're in the original and they all have their own little... Because like you have the Mia character. I can't even remember her name in the original. But the sister character in the original, she's... Shelly or something like that. No, I think Shelly's the girlfriend. <laughs> I'm so confused right now. The, uh, the, the sister in the original is... Like very monstrous, mm-hmm. uh, but then the girlfriend is like, what is she in? Like white yeah, makeup. Yeah, she's and like then, more of like taunting, like a doll or whatever. Well, they all have different levels of kind of taunting. Exactly. You know what I mean? They kind of complement each other in the way that they're gonna. They're all unique. Whereas in the reboot, it feels like Mia is instructing. Yeah, that's and that's zombies. what I was getting to. Is that like I do like all of the unique monsters in the original, but. I can also see where they were like, we've got to simplify things. We've got to focus the story. It's got to be about Mia and her brother and then eventually just about Mia. So we'll just have her, like I said, kind of as like the boss bitch or the leader yeah. who's just uh, kind of controlling these or planting these mindless. I mean, they're just zombies almost. Yeah. They're really good and they're really intimidating. But at the end of the day, they are just zombies. Well, you also got to keep in mind, like we didn't have Ash versus Evil Dead yet. So we, we haven't really seen them. Army of Darkness, they're called the Deadites. No, no, but I'm saying just in regards to like mixing those tones of like being really like gory, mm-hmm. but also being really comical, but and also having drama at the end. Like, I don't think show... they were trying to be comical in this. No, 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 they're not. But but just in regards to having those zombies kind of be zombies, they're like, okay, well, we'll make them more kind of stationary kind of monsters, but then we'll punch up the, the groundedness of how gory we're kind of being. And yeah, like with they, cutting off the arm yeah. and like the nail gun. They sacrifice kind of the uniqueness of the deadites, but they build with so much more or they replace it with so much more. They have the better gore effects. They have the more in, in tone gore effects. And then they have, I think, the Mia deadite or character or yeah. monster or whatever is a lot better. I also think it's enjoyable slash entertaining. The only thing I wonder is how enjoyable it would still be if it didn't have some of that comedy in it. Like so if for all, the reboot? For the reboot. Okay. Because when she's cutting off her arm, uh-huh. it's great cutting back to Mia where she's like encouraging her to do yeah, it. Yeah. She's like cheering her on. But I wonder how that would play if she wasn't being comical, if she was just like being like, do it. You know, like kind of being more dark about it and cutting off her arm. No, that's because that's not. I know. You, you, there's but a difference between being campy and yeah. being like a true deadite, and that line is so thin. But it's that balance of like you know, kind of funny moments with like super intense kind of horror mm-hmm. moments that that's always been the Evil Dead thing. That that's the thing that they borrow the most in this reboot. Uh, but then they also add a lot of kind of other stuff that it's not relying on the, on that. But you can still tell it's like if you didn't have Mia being comical in those moments, I don't know if that kind of act two. Would, would be as no, enjoyable yeah. as it is. It wouldn't. So it does. It is still enjoyable slash entertaining just for what it is, but uh, you can still feel the them being reliant on that you, kind of original. You talk about like Mia be co- being comical in the reboot. Like I, well, I, that's I, like I, that's, I'd say exaggerated because yeah. like it's com- it it could come across as comical, but like you're still staying in the serious tone. 
Yeah. So it, it's not like we're serious, it's deadly, and then she's being funny. It's we're serious, it's deadly, and she's being exaggerated, yeah. which is exactly how it is in like The Exorcist. It's not comical in a bad way. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it, it's more like it, does, when... it doesn't like it doesn't jump genres. Yeah. It, it still stays within the genre. It's like when you're kind of laughing just to release something exactly, when you're watching yeah. something. It's just funny just watching her like do it, do it, do it, yeah. <laughs> that kind of thing. Whereas in like don't 19... you do it, bitch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly, but if you never had the context of watching those first Evil Deads, I feel like that would come out of nowhere. No. You know what I mean? Like Not I said, in a bad way, I, I but guess... it feels like it would come out of nowhere. It would still be fresh, but you'd be like, if you're watching this, you'd be like, oh, wow, like this is I've never seen this before. Yeah, you'd see, you'd, yeah. it would seem different. Um, so that's going to be two checks again. So then our last question is going to be, does it stand on its own? And then this is going to be interesting because it, it's very similar to Carrie, where it's borrowing a lot of the stuff from the original, but... If you could pretend that this movie, that the original didn't exist and we only had the reboot, would it still stand on its own? And it, like I said, it's kind of hard because the things that they're borrowing from the 1981 version, or at least from the whole uh, three Evil Dead movies, yeah, the franchise, is not like a plot or character motivation or an arc or anything. It's really just like the, the tone. The yeah, tone of the, the Deadites. Not it's even the... the tone, because the tone in the original is campy to comedy. In this, it's serious horror. Well, just the only the, thing they're borrowing is the bad guy. Yeah, well, the evil dead. The way the, the way that the dead goes about kind of taking its victims in a very like turn up to a thousand kind yeah. of way, but also being like entertaining. I don't even think that's even the same evil because in the reboot they go through the whole thing about it being like a male demon, and in the original is just like ambiguous evil and I, th I think in the rest of the franchise in evil dead 2 and like army of darkness and ash vs evil dead it's all just more ambiguous evil yeah well it's already released in the original like we were saying like it's already out there whereas yeah. in this one it's more kind of uh ceremonial yeah right it's like you, you got to do this you got to cut off the face you got to do this blah, blah, you gotta blah, accidentally blah. get blood on the paper gotta... <laughs> well did that even actually trigger anything or did uh, he, or did, was yeah. it just like yeah it started the book because like he opens it up he pricks his fingers like ah it gets right on the book mm -hmm. and there was something else we just watched recently too where somebody accidentally i always go back to that buffy episode puts blood. <laughs> which one again it's the halloween one where oz bleeds on the oh yeah he thing. accidentally bleeds on like the frat house they, they're doing ceiling. like they're doing like a little like sigil for like their band for and for the house party yeah, doesn't he break it and on, it's like, like a real string? they're using like a real book yeah. and then he accidentally like bleeds on it yeah but just to kind of like put some checks and x's on this I, I will i'll probably say that it does stand on its own with the check but i'll put a i'll put a faded check because okay. i don't know what this movie would be if you didn't have that Sam Raimi influence just in regards to how like the evil What would any horror movie about? nowadays be though without the Sam Raimi influence? What if Sam Raimi never like if Sam Raimi never made Evil Dead, no horror movie. Well, would even ever if be. like you look at like Carrie for example, like like you said they could just take stuff from the book and they yeah. could have made whatever kind of adaptation they wanted of that. Where this they probably could have told the same story, but I wonder if I just think about Mia like saying all that stuff in the basement and like, you know, don't do it, don't I do it. I feel like they take a lot of stuff from that from The Exorcist too. But I just think that's like the one thing from the original that that's the thing that people like, but then they didn't have the kind of the production or like the plot around it. But mm -hmm. it, that thing they liked so much that it carried, you know, three movies almost. So in this one, that's the thing that they, they kind of keep, they don't use as much because they make up for the other, you know, the other parts. Flaws, of, yeah, yeah, the, the other camp, flaws. They replace they the have. campiness, yeah. 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 Uh, so I, I do think it stands on its own, but I'll still put like a little asterisk next to it just because a lot of it stands on its own, but I still think that they're, they're still relying on just that tone of the Deadites of what they're doing. I think that tone and like the, I don't know what you want to call it, the Mia villain or the original evil, whatever is possessing Mia. I don't think you, I think there was enough without Sam Raimi's original influence that they could have made it work. And on top of that, I think it has... It's, it's like the cherry on top, where it's like you don't need it for the movie to be successful. It's just nice to have. Yeah. Like those those scenes with Mia almost like reacting to the horror around her while she's possessed are great, but they don't make or break the movie. So it's, it's not like it's not like this whole support or like the crush that the whole thing's built off of. So even if you remove those and you still have this movie, I, I think it would still work. What's the yeah. original question? Uh, does it stand, does it stand on its own? Yeah, I think even if you were, even if you remove that like uh, very strict adherence to the Sam Raimi character, mm -hmm. insofar as the antagonist goes, um, you would still have a very successful horror movie. Some of my favorite parts, like like I said, it's like the cherry on top, but I still have like a smattering of other favorite parts that aren't that. Yeah, because I love the the end where she fucking chainsaws the thing in half. Yeah, that, that's not that 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 could be like in any horror movie. Not to say that it's generic. But that isn't something that's like dictated by Sam Raimi. 
Um, well, it's also one of the, it's more like a traditional buildup. Because yeah. like we said, we have the ceremonial pieces. Yeah, and it's it, all really going to build up to once she's kind of, you know, clean from this infection. That's when the big demons yeah, are going to come out and face stakes. off. Yeah. yeah. Um, the the twist of the either, it's either the demons leaving the bodies and letting the real souls come back, or them pretending to be the real souls in order yeah. to like get out of the trouble or whatever. And when the girlfriend's like, "Why does my face hurt?" and it's got like twelve <laughs> nails in it, like, uh, like I like that, and that's not really yeah. like a strict Sam Raimi thing that you need to you know borrow from. That is, I think that's, I, I think the way that Fide uses it is unique enough and stands on its own enough and then everything else the way the movie shot um the way uh the characters are portrayed the way that they're acted the way they're directed yeah. um all besides of, fuck face besides fuck face yeah all of them are just like i i think there's enough of a day on his own in there yeah. that really helps elevate this movie and helps you know establish it as a good standalone movie you don't need to be familiar with any of the Evil Dead yeah. franchise to enjoy this movie. He's probably the one of the bigger directors that we've done on this, or that even in the reboot genre, because you know he goes on to do Don't, Don't Breathe after this, and he's I know, actually but this not before this. No, but just in general, like I mean, how many other directors have we done either on this podcast with the sequels or in the reboots where they've had these like actually good projects after the fact too? Because um, outside of that, I'm pretty sure uh, with Carrie, uh, that director, she's gone on to do like really good episodes of television. Yeah, so like, they reference movies. her in like The Boys, yeah, and stuff like that too. But he's kind of done like you know another horror movie other after projects. another horror movie, and he actually he actually brought back uh, Jane Levy for Don't Breathe too. Yeah, so you know it's a nice little collaboration they work together. Um, but I mean, yeah, you know, it, it's it's it sounds like we kind of agree a lot on a lot of this stuff. You know, there's just like little differences here and there between the two, but it's it's we both agree it works. It's just how much it works. Yeah, it's it's a really nice addition to the Evil Dead world. And uh, like we were saying earlier, if it is canon, I would have liked to see a crossover between you know Mia and Ash to some extent. But um, if you're doing that math at home, that's going to be five checks and then one faded asterisk check. <laughs> so it's going to get one big check for uh, worth bringing back. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think it's a good way to kind of end this whole little mini series of what we're doing because. You know, you got the generic child's play to start it off. You got the really generic grudge. We kind of we kind of make it make up for it on the back half with a slightly stronger carry, and mm. then we're kind of finishing strong on this. So yeah. Well, Matt, that was a really good review. Uh, is there anything else that you think we should talk about? Yeah, I actually want to. Oof. Actually, give me a second. I don't. I don't feel too good. Let me get a water really quick. How do you feel? <laughs> so how are you feeling now? Honestly, not bad. Uh, I'm kind of hungry though. You want to get a pizza? How are you feeling now? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>